Hello, I'm Jean Meserve. Good afternoon and welcome to episode one of Reimagining American Democracy, a discussion series for everyone who believes in the future and the promise of American democracy. Rarely, if ever, has this country faced as many challenges to its democratic system as it has in recent years. There's unequal access to the polls. We've seen a flood of disinformation, uh, hacking of election systems, and of course, deep divides in our political conversations. Just a few, those are just a few of the many challenges that are facing American democracy today. So what are the critical elements of a healthy, vibrant, strong American democracy in which everyone's voice is heard and everyone's voice is counted? And what will it take to reimagine and revitalize American democracy? The Reimagining American Democracy series will be moderated by journalists like myself and will be convening conversations across party lines uh, between people who are thinkers and activists and policymakers and who are parts of organizations, all of whom are envisioning what a more vibrant democracy might actually look like and importantly, what it will take to get there. We have an incredible lineup of speakers for you today, including a conversation between Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms and former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. They'll be talking about the state of US democracy. And then we'll have a conversation with former Congressman Will Hurd and Eric Liu of Citizen University. They're going to talk about what it takes to bring us all back together and to get us actually talking and listening to one another again. Before we dive into episode one of Democracy in America, a quick welcome for the four nonprofit organizations who are making these sessions possible. The National Center for Civil and Human Rights, Freedom House, the George W. Bush Institute, and Issue One. Welcome to Reimagining American Democracy, a new discussion series dedicated to reimagining and to building a stronger, healthier, and more inclusive democracy in the US. I'm Mike Abramowitz, the president of Freedom House. Freedom House is a nonprofit organization founded on the core conviction that freedom flourishes in democratic nations where governments are accountable to their people. We're best known for our work assessing the condition of political rights and civil liberties in countries all over the world. Today, we see US democracy at a pivotal point, and we're hoping to bring the focus back home. Our co-hosts in this cross-partisan effort include the National Center for Civil and Human Rights, the George W. Bush Institute, and Issue One. Jill, tell us more. Thank you, Mike. I'm Jill Savitt, President and CEO of the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. The center is a museum and human rights organization in Atlanta that inspires people to tap their own power to change the world around them. From the US civil rights movement to more recent social justice campaigns, our museum presents decades of change in America and how that change has been powered by we the people working to defend basic civil and human rights. We're co-hosting Reimagining American Democracy because we see this as a historic moment for change and an opportunity to fulfill the promises of democracy, to build a stronger, more inclusive America for everyone. Holly, let's hear from you. Thank you, Jill. I'm Holly Kuzmich, Executive Director of the George W. Bush Institute. At the Bush Institute, we develop leaders, advance policy, and take action to solve today's pressing challenges. And one of those pressing challenges continues to be human freedom. How can we extend freedom and democracy around the world and ensure that we protect and strengthen it at home? We're co-hosting Reimagining American Democracy because we believe in building a stronger, more inclusive democracy in the United States. Finally, let's go to Nick. Well, thank you, Holly, and hello, everybody. My name is Nick Penniman, and I am the founder and CEO of Issue One. Issue One is the leading cross-partisan organization in Washington that brings together Democrats and Republicans and independents to fix our broken political system and repair our democracy together. That's why this speaker series is so important to us. Obviously, democracy is broken right now. 
but it's only going to get fixed if we all come together and we all imagine solutions and then we enact those solutions as one national community. So on behalf of Issue One and our co-hosts, thank you so much for listening in today. We also want you to participate in the conversation as much as you can, and you can do that through the hashtag Democracy Reimagined. That's hashtag Democracy Reimagined. And just become a part of this conversation and a part of this vital dialogue moving forward. So thanks again to the speakers and to my fellow co-hosting groups, and thanks to you all for being here and being part of this. And now for a conversation on the challenges and potential of American democracy, I'd like to wel welcome former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice and Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms. And this conversation, I should mention, was pre-recorded. Secretary Rice and Mayor Bottoms, thanks to both of you for joining us today to talk about the state of American democracy. It's a critical conversation at a critical time. As you both well know, American democracy has faced many recent challenges. I'd like to talk a little bit about what we're dealing with and what we can do to improve democracy, to make it work better. So first, I'd like to ask you both a question. You're a physician. You're asked to give a diagnosis as to the health of American democracy. What do you say? Is it healthy? Is it ailing? Is it on life support? Mayor Bottoms, why don't I start with you? Well, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to share with you this evening. Uh, if I were a physician, I would say that we are on the mend. Um, what we saw happen at the US Capitol and the attacks that we have seen across the country, quite frankly, um, as it relates to access to the ballot, has been something that I certainly did not expect to see in my lifetime. Uh, but that being said, I think there is an awareness uh, from people across the country and uh, an eagerness to engage and to be a part of this democracy. And so we saw the absolute worst happen at the Capitol, the US Capitol a few months ago. Uh, we, we are seeing things very troubling happening in state legislatures across the country. Uh, but I do believe that there's healing taking place across this country because people are registering to vote and turning out to vote in record numbers. And I think in large part that is in direct response uh, to the attack that so many of us have witnessed on our democracy, uh, not just at the US Capitol, but quite frankly, over the past um, several years um, with the previous president. Secretary Rice, what's your diagnosis? Well, my diagnosis would be that the vital organs are just fine, um, that the institutions are strong. Um, in fact, I would uh, agree with uh, Mayor Bottoms that uh, uh, January 6th was a, a kind of uh, stress test, if you will, for those institutions. And uh, while what happened at the Capitol was very awful, I will never forget uh, what happened after that. And so um, I got in bed that night to watch the certification of the vote. And I watched these people, these Congress people go back into the Capitol after it was secured and in the most boring way possible, certify the vote. And I watched the vice president of the United States certify a vote that put him out of office. And I thought American democracy is just fine. And oh, by the way, thank you for Alexander Hamilton and James Madison and uh, Mike Pence. So um, the institutional design of the United States is really quite extraordinary. Uh, we do have some problems. I, I will say this, um, I hope we can each come out of our corners a little bit uh, because we do have some real issues to resolve. We even have some real issues to resolve around our electoral system. It rich, really shouldn't be the case that people have to stand in line for the long, long periods that they do. It shouldn't be the case that it takes North Carolina three and a half weeks uh, to count the votes. Uh, we had a commission uh, after the election of twenty uh, uh, of two thousand and one, the the Bush v. Gore, uh, that made a lot of recommendations about how we could improve the electoral system. And to my knowledge, many of them were not taken up. And so, um, while I understand and would agree with Mayor Bottoms, we have to be careful that we don't send any signals about about uh, voting. We want people to vote. We also have some dysfunctions in our electoral system that uh, that bear watching. And I say that as somebody who went around the world 
telling people how to run their electoral systems as the American Secretary of State. I guess I want to push back on both of you. I'm surprised you're both so optimistic, given what we're facing right now. We have uh, one of the political parties um, not accepting uh, or embracing at least the results uh, of the last presidential election. You have a number of state legislators, uh, legislatures, including Georgia's, um, passing restrictive voting laws. Um, and the partisanship seems even deeper than it was before. Um, Mayor Bottoms, your response to that? Well, I, I think our democracy is built on optimism. The, 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 it's the reason that even when we sometimes get it wrong, uh, there's an opportunity for people to go back to the polls every few years and try and get it right. And that's what our democracy is all about. And so you have to be optimistic because if you don't believe uh, that things will get any better, then I think it takes, it takes us into an even darker place than we have been over the past few years. But what kept so many of us hopeful across the country, even uh, in the midst of, of the term of the last president, was knowing there would be an opportunity for us to go to the polls and cast a vote and fix it. And that's what people did across this country. And so I can't help but be optimistic. And, and I have four kids that I have to be hopeful for, um, because if I, if I don't if, if I don't show that I'm hopeful um, about the promise of our country, then um, certainly with all that they are facing on a day-to-day -day basis, then it, it, it makes them not believe in the promise of this country. And I, I don't have four kids, but I think I've got 1,400 or something like that. I'm a professor. And um, I also want to be optimistic for them. I will say this, um, Jean, the entire party didn't uh, say that this election was not legitimate. So let's remember, um, I think I, for instance, congratulated uh, then President-elect Biden the very next day and certainly Kamala Harris, who I know from California. Uh, but this is what I mean by uh, there are some issues about confidence in our electoral system that we have to address. There are an awful lot of people who didn't think uh, that uh, Donald Trump was a legitimate president. We had people who didn't go to his inaugural because they said he wasn't a legitimate president. This has been coming along for a while. And I'm often asked, is this revolutionary? Well, you know, a revolution is what happens when you don't see an evolution happening. And so uh, we have to recognize that uh, we need to bring everybody back into the tent. Now, I think that it is, and I said it, uh, President Trump should have recognized the electoral victory of uh, President Biden. He should have done it. And um, I've made my views clear on that. But, but let's remember that when we talk about the way social media is working, which by the way, I'm really glad I wasn't Secretary of State when we had social media because uh, Mayor Bottoms, I don't know what it is like to be an elected official having to deal with social media all the time because it makes you say what comes first to your mind. And that's actually not a good thing. And so let's all back off saying what first comes to our minds. Take people's concerns seriously, wherever they come from, even if we don't agree with them, and see if we can bridge some of the divide. Mayor Bottoms, did you want to respond to that social media comment? Yeah, it's awful. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, 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 it is terrible. And uh, I, I find myself wanting to read it because sometimes I get helpful information and it tells me what people are concerned about. But at the end of the day, we're human. And so for all of the helpful information you get, uh, when you start to see the negative information, uh, it, 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 it can be concerning to you. And, and it, again, I, I go back to my four kids. It really frightens me for my, my children and all that they take in uh, and their ability to, at their young ages, decipher between what's real um, and, and what's not. And so it is um, something that I think every elected official in this country has to grapple with. How do we get information? How do we stay in touch with our constituencies, um, but also have the ability to figure out what's fiction? And I'll, I'll just go back, I'll just make this one point. When I ran for mayor, I did two focus groups. And I was stunned when the focus group of Black women under 40 came into the room and the question was asked, where did they get their news? And they said, Instagram. 
I was blown away by that. I didn't expect it, but it, it, it is our reality. And I think uh, incumbent upon us to put out factual information because of course we have to meet people where they are. Mayor Rod, I was just curious if the social media environment or some other aspect of democracy played a part in your decision not to run for reelection. No, it, it, it really did not. Um, I, uh, I thankfully have a lot of discipline as it relates to so, social media. And even when I am scrolling through just to see, you know, what people in the city are talking about, I, I can turn it off when it gets to be too toxic. So there were a number of reasons that I decided not to run for office. I can't point to any one thing, but I've always said that I wanted to leave the city better than I found it. And I wanted to leave on top and leave when I was um, in a position of strength. And, and that's where I am. And just as voters have the opportunity to make decisions every four years, um, elected officials do as well. So I'm, I'm taking this opportunity to pass the baton. Secretary Rice, you mentioned that when you were Secretary of State, American democracy was an example. It was a tool. Do you think it still is? Can it still be used that way around the world? I absolutely believe it can be used that way around the world. Uh, you know, it's really interesting. Uh, there's a lot of criticism of America out there, but people are still filling up the lines at our consulates and our embassies to try to get here. People are still sending their kids here, particularly if they are from the elites. They're sending their kids to Stanford and Emory and, and Harvard, and, and they, they want to be a part of America. People are still coming here in droves to be a part of this great American dream. One of the, the things that I'm a big advocate of for is uh, we need immigration. Uh, we are a country of immigrants. Uh, without immigration, we have the same sclerotic demographics of Europe and Japan and Russia. And so uh, we remain a beacon to people. Do we have problems? Yes. Uh, one of the things that I always said when I was abroad was I grew up in segregated Birmingham, Alabama. I was eight when the Civil Rights Act passed. My family couldn't go to a movie theater or to a restaurant until we moved, until, until that, that legislation. And I didn't have a white classmate until we moved to Denver when I was 12. I don't see the United States through rose colored glasses, but I do see a United States that has kept struggling forward and trying to make it better and trying to include more people as we've gone along. And that's really the story of democracy because no human system, including democracy is perfect. It just has to keep working toward perfectibility. And uh, so um, I always found it useful when I was talking to young democracies to say, um, it's a tough struggle. It's gonna take you a while. You're gonna stumble and fall. Sometimes you're gonna make mistakes, but if you just keep up, keep, uh, keep trying, you'll learn that it's well worth it. So Secretary Rice, I'm particularly interested then in your reaction to what we're seeing happen all around this country. Some say it's election security. Some say it's not that at all. What's about what it's about is restricting who can vote. Given your background, how does that sit with you? Look, I know what it looks to, like to restrict people to vote. Uh, my father had to take a poll test that he was supposed to count how many beans were in a jar. Right. So, so this this is not Jim Crow. And we don't get anywhere by over-dramatizing what we're going through. I will tell you, and I'm, I'm pretty frustrated with both sides here. There are two uh, terms that are meant to stop the conversation, voter fraud and voter suppression. They're meant to stop the conversation, not start it. The fact is we have some things we need to look at in our electoral system. And if we could walk away, I, I, I don't like legislators taking this into their own hands, frankly. I think we probably need to go back to some kind of bipartisan commission to try to figure this out. But the states do have the constitutional uh, obligation to organize their elections. Now, would I like to see more standardization of some of this? Yes. Because as I said, you have states that are taking three and a half weeks to count. Florida, after Bush v. Gore, actually made some very important changes to their electoral system. It worked much better. So if we could step back and ask, what would we like to do to make it better for people to vote, uh, easier for people to vote, but also so that people feel that there's a sense of security, I think that would be a very good thing. And uh, then we can look at voter 
ID. Most states have it. Um, and so let's walk away from these polarizing terms and look at uh, where we are in terms of elections, because whatever you want to say, there are a lot of people on both sides who don't fully trust the system. Mayor Bottoms, I know you have spoken out against what's happened in Georgia and the laws that were passed there. Do you want to respond to Secretary Rice? You know what I see happening in Georgia, and I'll, I'll, I'll give that example before, because, of course, this is my state. Um, when you have elections that are so close, it really is an attempt just to uh, skim off the margins. And so when you uh, uh, give the legislature the ability to take over local elections, when you uh, remove the secretary of state from uh, the state election board and, and any number of, of other restrictions um, limiting the number of ballot boxes and, and where they can be located. Um, the, the changes to absentee ballots, ballots and, and the list goes on. Uh, it really is an attempt just to skim the margins, a few, a few thousand here, a few hundred there, and then you have the election going the other way. Um, I, I know that in Georgia, changes are needed to our election system. Um, but this was an opportunity for those changes to be in a way uh, that would allow everyone equal access to the ballot box. And unfortunately, uh, the legislature didn't take that opportunity. But I've often repeated a story shared by Ambassador Andrew Young. He gives the example of his 1972 election to Congress. There was one day of voting. He said it rained all, all day and, and into the evening. Um, and still there was a record turnout and even a 70 plus percent turnout in the African-American community. So his point was that even with those restrictions, we all still have the ability to turn out to vote. And I do believe in Georgia and across this country, um, you are going to see people continue to turn out in record numbers because and in spite of these restrictions. Well, could I, could I just uh, pick up here? Because, uh, you know, there may be more in common here between us than, than uh, you would think. Um, I, obviously, I want everybody to be able to vote. But people will vote when they want to vote. They will vote. And so um, I am a firm believer in making it as possible for people to vote. I won't say as easy because uh, I actually personally think that using signature verification is a recipe for disaster. Um, as a matter of fact, we used to go around the country, around the world telling people not to do that. Because uh, to my understanding, uh, in Colorado, for instance, they trained their volunteers for a long time using former Secret Service and former FBI, because you can imagine that the volunteer whose eyes get tired, and so every signature is either accepted or every signature is rejected. So I think there are some really serious issues with the way we run our elections. I also think we're going to have close elections. We, uh, for the foreseeable future, these elections are going to be close. So I don't think it's good enough to say, well, let's just keep them as they are. I think we're going to have to deal with why there are people that have concerns about the elections. And so the close elections have to be, uh, it, 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 people have to have a, a sense of confidence in the system. And that's why I really do think we need to take a look at some of these practices. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And I think this would have been a great opportunity, not just in Georgia, but across the country to have a bipartisan, a group or a commission take a look at these elections. Um, and I think that in and of itself would have given people confidence in the recommendations that were made. Um, for example, in Georgia, uh, there are limitations now on casting provisional ballots. Well, I'm one of those people, I've shown up uh, at a precinct and my precinct had been changed. I, along with several hundred other people showed up at a precinct that somehow none of us uh, realized that the precinct had been changed. And fortunately, I had time in my day to go to the other precinct and cast my ballot. But I think of, of the people who stood in line on their lunch break, many of whom I saw get out of line and leave, uh, who didn't have an opportunity to go to another precinct and under the current changes in Georgia law would not have an opportunity 
uh, to cast a provisional ballot, uh, uh, with, except under very limited circumstances. So I, I think a bipartisan approach to examining our election laws would have been helpful in Georgia. And I think it would be helpful across the country and it could give us all more confidence in the recommendations. I, I, I do just wanna say we've, we've had a lot of bipartisan commissions, including the Carter uh, bipartisan commission back in 2001. We could even start there. I mean, there were a lot of recommendations made there that were not taken up. Uh, but I'll say this, you know, I, I'm not a resident of Georgia, and so I don't want to get into the details of the law. I just hope that, um, you know, that some of the language around this has not been helpful. Um, I, I've never, I never let people use the word Cold War to explain what's happening with China, because that was a specific circumstance. Jim Crow is not what's happening in Georgia. And to say that erodes confidence in people, because I grew up in Jim Crow. And this isn't it. So and, we've talked. Well, I'll, I'll just say I've, I've never used that language. But I know you haven't, uh, <laughs> Mayor. There are people who have. But, but, but I, I, I certainly, I, I, I hear you, and, and I, I certainly, but I also understand the sentiment of those who, who have used it. So you are hearing one another. That's something kind of unique in this day and age. And since I asked you for your diagnosis, I now want to ask you for your prescriptions. Secretary Rice, how do we get through this poisonous partisanship that uh, is infecting so much of our political conversation? Well, I hate to keep blaming social media because I live in I live in Silicon Valley, and these are all my friends, by the way, that uh, started these companies. So well, don't then talk the to way. them, Secretary Rice. Right? <laughs> don't take this the wrong they way. They have but to be part of the solution. They, they do, and I think they want to be part of the solution. But you know, part of the problem is that it's easy now for us to go into our little tribes and only talk to people who think the way we do. It's easy. The conversation that the mayor and I are having. Uh, it's, it's hard to have that conversation for a lot of people because immediately people want you to jump to one side or another. And so if we could actually start to have people listen to people who, with whom they disagree, talk to people with whom, I even say to my students, you don't have a constitutional right not to be offended. If somebody offends you, just tell them that that was offensive and talk about why. So I think every American has to start by taking responsibility not to be part of the problem. I think that will ultimately be reflected in Washington. The interesting thing is I think it is more reflected in local politics and state politics because they have to get things done. Uh, when you get to Washington, it gets particularly intense. The only other thing I would say to our leaders, particularly those in Washington is, um, you know, coming across the aisle, compromise is actually not a dirty word. Um, when the founding fathers created these institutions, they created them so that there would be time for compromise. And uh, if I could say one thing to, uh, to the current administration, uh, people for whom I have a lot of admiration, uh, please try not to do everything 50-50 plus one. Mayor Bottoms, you're at the local level. Tell us what the conversation is like there. Is it as polarized? And do you see any way of making it less so? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, many uh, municipalities uh, don't have partisan elections. For example, the Atlanta mayor's race is not a partisan election. There are times that I wish that it were because I, I would at least have a natural group of allies, but it does create an opportunity for people who you might uh, look at physically and think will be would be aligned. It does give an opportunity for us to disagree. Um, but but again, um, at the local level, people expect results, and so we don't have the luxury of not getting it done and then going home. Because on your way home, when you stop at the grocery store somebody's go going to remind you that you didn't get it done. So it forces us to work together and compromise uh, because we are on the ground and it doesn't get any closer to the community uh, th than at the local level. I, I was taking a walk the other day, a woman stopped me and waved her water bill in my face and told me we had not been responsive and, and handed it to me and told me I needed to take care of it. That's what happens at the local level. And unfortunately, I don't think we always have that uh, in Washington. 
We're almost out of time, but I want to ask you both. Are the right people running for office? Mayor Bottoms, you've decided not to run again. Um, are the people who are running the kind who are going to be able to bridge the divide and get stuff done and make democracy work? I think like with, with anything, they're good candidates and they're bad candidates. I am concerned that a number of people are running for office simply uh, for the what they perceive to be the celebrity of serving in office. Um, but I also know that there are people who are well-intentioned and who really want to do right by our community seeking to serve. And I think it's just, it's incumbent upon voters to be a part of the process. We can't stay home during any election, especially our, um, our local elections. Uh, Secretary Rice, there, se there seems to be a tendency of people to blame institutions, to blame politicians. Does it come back to the citizens? Or are they the ones who really have to take command? Absolutely, it does. And uh, look, there are a lot of good people who run for office. We make it awfully hard. You know, we we treat them as if they something must be wrong with them or they must be seek, seeking personal gain. There are a lot of ways to seek personal gain that have nothing to do with running for office. And so uh, we make it hard. But I do think a lot of good people run for office. And yes, uh, it starts with every one of us. My my good friend and mentor, George Schultz, uh, died uh, a little over the age of 100, a few months after his 100th birthday. He used to wear a tie that said democracy is not a spectator sport. And I think that really sums it up for all of us. Uh, we have to be a part of it. We have to embrace it. Uh, we get the democracy that we work for and that we therefore deserve. Secretary Rice, Mayor Bottoms, thank you both so much for joining us here today for this conversation. Thank you. And now for a conversation on reviving public discourse in America. And let me remind you that this part of the programming is live. We'd love to hear your questions. Please submit them on chat. Let me introduce my guests now. Former Texas Congressman Will Hurd is here with me, as is Eric Liu. He's CEO and co-founder at Citizen University and executive director for the Citizenship and American Identity Program at the Aspen Institute. Great to have you both with us. Disagreement and debate, I'm sure we can agree, are a vital part of American democracy. And one always hopes that we'll reach compromise or that the best people and ideas will rise to the top. However, we have seen less and less conversation and debate and more and more argument. So I'd like to start here with a question from both of you. January 6th, the storming of the Capitol, does that represent our utter failure to talk to one another and listen to one another. Congressman Hurd, let me start with you. Uh, sure, that, 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 that started, that insurrection was because um, people had been lied to, right? And, 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 and elected officials had taken advantage of their position and perpetuated um, ultimately a, a lie. Now, as Secretary Rice um, said, uh, later that night was an example of, of how our, our democracy is, is working. Now, I wish more people would have voted uh, to, to certify that, that election, but this is, I, I think, the, the no, what happened on January 6th uh, shows uh, the kind of truth decay uh, that is happening across our, 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 our society, and it also shows the, the lack of trust that people have in, in a lot of institutions and not just the, the, the federal government. And so, so I, I think it's something that we all have to remember. And, and unfortunately, uh, um, most folks have short memories, um, but we, the, you know, I, I was in the CIA when 9-11 happened. And when, when uh, those, the, the second plane hit the World Trade Center, all of us that had been involved in counterterrorism knew that was it. And, and this, this, this idea of Islamic radicalization was the existential crisis of, of the, the 2000s. I think this issue of truth decay and, and disinformation and misinformation and lack of trust in our institutions is an existential crisis that we're, we're gonna be dealing with in the, in the 2020s. And Eric Liu, does it also represent our failure to communicate with one another? Well, I think it represents a failure not only to communicate with one another, but to actually take a certain kind of responsibility uh, for the day-to-day -day tending of the garden of democracy. Uh, the Congressman is absolutely right that January 6th happened, the insurrection happened because people were lied to, but people are lied to all the time by politicians. What was different here is that large numbers of organized people wanted to believe the lie. 
and still want to believe the lie and still want to weaponize the lie. And to me, what's not just interesting, but dangerous about that is the motivation for wanting to believe the lie, right? Conspiracy thinking and that truth decay that the congressman is talking about um, are symptoms of an underlying ailment. And the underlying ailment is isolation, disconnection from one another, and the, and the disappearance of a shared common sense of truth and fact. Uh, when you have that, and you have this kind of fragmented information ecosphere where it's wholly possible just to go down a rabbit hole and, uh, and believe, not only because these are the facts, quote unquote, that you're receiving, but also because you want to believe it, that your guy's been wronged and you must storm the Capitol to right this wrong. Um, that, that to me is a much deeper illness than simply a failure to listen to each other. So yeah, Eric Liu, what, Jean, go ahead. Jean, if I could add on to that, this, this um, you know, the inability to separate fact from fiction and, and where do you go to get information? And, and some of this is this, this cognitive bias of uh, you're gonna accept something based on your own experiences um, even if it's counter to what what facts are out are out there, and and so so uh, how do we deal with that? Now, uh, I'm excited about the future. I think our best days are ahead of us. I still think you know it's going to get a little bit roughier and bumpier um, as we get there, but we are going to get to a better place. And I, I had the experience of of teaching a class at University of Chicago, and some of these kids were amazing. And guess what? They don't trust anything. They're, you know, they're discriminating on the information that they're getting. They're making sure that they're, they're, getting, uh, they're getting facts and, and seeking and trying to seek the truth. So that's the kind of mentality that we, you know, if we have that at all generations, uh, I think we'd be doing a little bit better off. But Congressman, we had a vote yesterday on the possibility of a bipartisan commission to look at what happened on January 7th, and 175 Republicans voted against that. Does that demonstrate that things aren't just going to be rough for a little while, they're going to be rough for quite a while? Uh, how long they're going to be rough for, I don't know. I, I would also say there was 35 Republicans that did vote for it, right, that are saying that we should be looking at this, we'll see what happens um, in the Senate, you have committees that are evaluating this. I, I think we need uh, folks that are outside of the current political environment to to look at what happened. What were the consequences? Uh, why, you know, what was the actual physical response? I, I look at it as as a former member who had a number of staff that were there. Look, I, I was trained for this. I've been in embassies that were almost taken out. Um, I, you know, I, I have some experience in how to deal with, with this kind of issue and try to fix it and, and also how to deal with the psychological after effects of this. Uh, you have a lot of young men and women that are coming from their hometown thinking they're going to help their, you know, their hometown congressman do big things. And, and they're, they're scared, worrying about, man, am I going to get attacked in my room? So, so because we got to be prepared if this were to ever happen again and making sure the response is there. Uh, so, so yes, I, I wish I would have seen uh, more Republicans vote for this, uh, but the, you know, the, the, is 35, 35 voting for it um, is better than five, right? Um, but, I, but again, I wish it was, it was over in the 200s. Uh, so Eric Lou, just to pursue this a little bit further, because there's a lot of lip service given to bipartisanship and not much evidence of it. There's a bill in front of Congress that would promote civic education. And even that has become a partisan flashpoint. Well, I want to get to that civic education uh, legislation in a moment, but I think the, you know, the vote yesterday about the January 6th commission um, is evidence of a general rule. And Congressman Hurd is an exception to the rule, I think, uh, as perhaps are many of those 35 uh, who voted yesterday to advance the commission. But the rule is this. Most of the time, our elected leaders are not leaders. They are exquisitely attuned followers. They sniff out where the heat is, they sniff out where the votes are, they sniff out where the threats are to their own incumbency, and they will follow that. And so, again, uh, what Condoleezza Rice was saying, Secretary Rice was saying in the first segment about the responsibility ultimately falling to us. Um, she and I have very different political views, but I fundamentally agree with that. I think the responsibility is on us to lead our leaders in a way that is more healthy, more reality-based, uh, and more responsible. Right, and so um, I think th that there is a critical mass right now uh, of people who are loud, conspiracy-minded, and quite frankly, anti-democratic, anti-small-d democratic, um, uh, and they have uh, taken, they have led the leadership of one of the two major parties in the United States um, away from a deep underlying commitment to the principles of a democratic republic. But I yeah, think there are a lot of other folks 
who want to vote for that party, who's prince, who are principled conservatives, who can actually lead their leaders back in the direction that Congressman Hurd is both talking about and has himself modeled and advanced at different times in his uh, recent career. But <clears throat> to this civic education uh, controversy, and for those who don't know about it, there's a, uh, been a bipartisan bill uh, advance that would really uh, invest substantially in uh, one of the foundations of how we've gotten here. We, the decay in the body politic did not happen overnight. It is, it is the result and perhaps the predictable result of several decades of intentional underinvestment in civic learning and civic education, both federally and at the state and local level. Um, and when you have you know, one out of uh, three people not being able to name all three branches of government, when you have more people able to name a judge on American Idol than a justice on the Supreme Court, um, it's actually a miracle that January 6th didn't happen sooner, right? Uh, and so this bipartisan bill to start investing in both uh, teacher training and curriculum and so on and so forth to, to strengthen our capacity for civic learning uh, is absolutely necessary. And yet it too has become a football uh, in just the same kind of hyper-partisan wars uh, that are going on right now. Um, and I think, I, I hope that the sponsors of that bill will hold strong, lock arms together and advance this because this is something that is not about the current moment of uh, what thing is trending on Twitter, what attack can you make on the other party? This is about the core capacity of our ability to govern ourselves as citizens. Gene, there's, there's a trend. Uh, if you look at the political spectrum, the edges, it's not a line anymore. It's a horseshoe. The edges of both parties are closer to each other than they are to the middle, right? You, you see, you th see an authoritarianism um, growing in, in, in both edges of, of the party, and that's not a good thing for the country. Why is that? The reason is the structure of 92% in, in, in the House of Representatives, 92% of the people that go to Congress, that person has decided in a primary. And, and so, so last cycle, there were, there were 30, 34 seats, 31 uh, Democrats and seats that uh, President Trump had won the previous presidential election, and only three Republicans in seats that Hillary Clinton had won in the previous election. And so, so what happens, you know, that, that 8%, they have to compete in the general election, and that's where that competition of ideas, and guess what, those folks, when they win, they get rewarded for solving problems. In those other 92%, they talk to only those kinds of primary voters. And on average, sorry for the math lesson here this morning, on average, I think, I think, I think in 2020, about 55,000 people voted in a primary. Now, if you do that, if you look at a general election, you're talking north of 275,000, 325,000. It's a bigger group of people. So guess what? Point one, vote in primaries, okay? Like this is, this, we need to get, we need to get engaged. Uh, you have one party rule in Texas, Republicans. You have one party rule in California, Democrats. Um, that's why you see some of these extreme things happen because we're not having a competition of ideas in some of those areas. That competition of ideas is important to us and we have to get there. We need civic education. We need folks to understand how the government works and their role in that. Because guess what? We have some serious generation defining challenges that our country is faced with. And if we don't have a competition of ideas and I do this, we're gonna be in a position that a Roman in 475 AD was when the next year the Western Roman Empire fell and the people looking around being like, what's a Goth, right? And so, so this, is, this, is, this is why we have to get this right in order to solve these problems. No, one, no, one of the things, Gene, if you just think about actually, uh, not, not to shamelessly pander, but just the organizations that are sponsoring our gathering here today and the kinds of work that each of them is doing right, is, is going to the heart of what has to happen right now. So Freedom House and their work to actually shine a light on the ways in which you cannot take for granted um, freedom and a capacity to govern ourselves. Uh, and the fact is the United States, we're number one in a lot of things, but we're not number one on freedom anymore. We're, we're far from number one. We're deep into double digits uh, in the world rankings there. Um, if you think about the National Center for Civil and Human Rights in Atlanta, what they're doing is not just history and showing you the people who led the civil rights movement, the people who've led other liberation movements around the world, what they're asking you to do is to step into the question, what would you do right now? Which is not an idle hypothetical question. It's a question live on the streets of Georgia. It's a question live in the streets of Minneapolis. It's a question everywhere in the United States. What would you do if you start to see democracy eroded or threatened? The George W. Bush Center has been running in partnership with the Clinton Library and the LBJ Center 
um, an amazing program called the Presidential Leadership Scholars Program that's getting people from right and left, Republicans and Democrats, people who are just problem solvers to learn to build trust among each other and to build the skill of not only listening to each other, but holding space for other folks to build that muscle, right? And issue one is one of the organizations out there that uh, um, is really advancing not just campaign finance reform, but some of these structural changes that have to happen in our democracy. Well, you know, Congressman Heard, you're talking about primaries. Well, primaries, yeah, if more people voted in primaries, that could change the complexion of things. But if you had ranked choice voting, that would also change the complexion of things. If you had something other than just first past the post, winner takes all voting. If you had multi-member districts, there are a lot of ways in which you can change the rules to get more people to show up, more people to want to show up. And uh, I think this is a time right now where we can't just take the system as it exists. We have to ask ourselves in the name of this whole uh, series and webinar, how do we reinvent? How do we reimagine some of the ways that we deal with each other? And that's both a, a matter of rules, but it's also a matter of culture, norms, attitudes, habits, and values. And I think we, this is what we teach at Citizen University. We're not talking about structural change. We're talking about what's upstream of that, which is culture and the way in which we learn to deal with each other. Eric, uh, Eric Liu, I want to ask you, because you are all about having conversations and having people talk to one another. How do you talk to people who don't believe in facts? And one of our viewers asks, how do we go about creating or compiling a shared set of facts that we can debate? Well, on the second part of that question, um, I'd toss that question right back to you, Gene. I think journalists uh, uh, and media entities uh, have a heavy lift right now in creating a sense of trusted uh, fact space. But the first part of the question, I think it's really important because uh, I would say, you got to remember, humans are not rational calculating machines. We are not machines waiting for fact inputs, which we then weigh on a balance and then kind of spit out a judgment. Humans are emotional animals, and we will seek out the facts that we are motivated to seek out. And so I think one of the most important things that we've got to do, we run a project um, called the Better Arguments Project. It's a partnership of the Aspen Institute, uh, Facing History and Ourselves, a fantastic uh, uh, nonprofit education organization, um, and the Allstate Corporation. What the Better Arguments Project starts with is as polarized and toxic as our politics are right now, we don't actually need fewer arguments in American civic life. We just need less stupid arguments. And less stupid arguments means arguments that are more attentive to the ways in which there are emotional drivers for why people want to go to um, a set of purported facts. And the way to unwind that is to build a relationship first, prioritize relationship. If I can connect with you then and understand what your pain is, what your fear is, what your hopes are, that will give me an insight into why it is that you're inclined to believe X or Y. And number two, if I can enter into that argument, not with the intention of I'm going to win, I'm going to crush you, I'm going to bury you under my facts, but rather I just want to understand. I'm taking winning off the table. I want to understand your heart and your head and where you're coming from. If you come that way, you can have a better argument and change the dynamic. But aren't those conversations onesies and twosies? I mean, how do you really make them scalable and make a societal change? Democracy is a set of compounded onesies and twosies. Democracy is, a, is an infinite web of this, this kind of personal responsibility taking from dyad to dyad to circles of family and community and neighborhood. Um, this cannot be done top down. I prefer this president to his predecessor. But this president is not going to save American democracy. It's going to happen because people who've tuned to the, the 223 people watching this webinar right now uh, have, are going to decide tonight, I'm going to talk to my neighbor differently. Tonight, I'm going to talk to my family differently. This weekend, I'm going to go to my faith gathering a little differently with a different posture. And I'm going to set off, look, I hate to use this word in the middle of the tail end of a pandemic, but in the affirmative sense, we can set off contagions. We set off contagions and we scale things sideways by the way we set examples. This cannot be a top-down, trickle-down approach to, um, to how we reinvent uh, our democratic culture. Congressman Hurd, can these conversations take place in Congress? I mean, you yeah, have people sure. in Congress who believe in QAnon, for instance. Could you have this kind of conversation with them? Th th these conversations can work. And look, I'm, I'm nowhere near as, as smart as Eric to, to break all these things down. And, and I agree with a lot of what he was saying. But it starts with individual needs to model the behavior you want to see, right? And so are you doing it the right, like when it's small and when it's easy? Because if you can't do it when it's easy and small, 
then you're not going to be able to do it when it's hard. And, and so it, it's, it, it's, you know, everybody asks some of the, some of the tough decisions I made when I was in Congress, those were easy. To, there was no question about it because I had a series of the smaller victories and where it made those decisions. And so model the behavior. I think for elected officials, listen first, don't try to persuade. If you understand what people are talking about, then you're gonna be able to communicate better. And guess what? I did it, right? I'm a black Republican that won in a 71% Latino district that Hillary, a district Hillary Clinton won and, and Beto O'Rourke beat Ted Cruz in, right? The, the reason is because I showed up, I listened to people and tried to solve their problem. And what I've learned is that I don't care where you're from, what your background is, what your ethnicity, who your mom or daddy is. People want to be able to put, put food on their table, a roof over the head, and make sure the people they love are healthy and happy. When we, when we talk about those issues, you can get things done. Oh, and by the way, Congress has done some big things together, right? There was three packages, three COVID packages that helped us set the, set the stage for us to get out of this um, pandemic. Those were done in overwhelmingly bipartisan fashion. I guarantee you nobody ever is, will click on an article that says Congress works. Nobody's clicking on that. People are clicking on it when it something, says something crazy, right? And, and so, so that is what, you know, that, stop doing that, right? Click, when there's a good thing, click on that good message, right? And, and so let's, let's drive those algorithms to get more positive stuff going. So, so these are steps you can take. Democracy is hard. It's not easy. It's not for everyone, but it's work because we have men and, and women that are willing to fight hard. And it starts with what I began this, these remarks with. You know, Model the behavior you want to see. If you think about what makes people do stuff that might be hard in the way that the congressman is talking, um, the answer is always relationship and a sense of shared purpose, right? Mm -hmm. And so one of the things we do at Citizen University is called Civic Saturdays, these gatherings that have now sprouted up all around the United States that are essentially a civic analog to a faith gathering, right? It's not church, it's not mosque or synagogue, but it has the arc and the flow and the feel of that because you enter into a space of belonging with strangers, you turn to them and you start talking about not what's your stance on this healthcare bill or on taxes, but just a, a harder, deeper question like, who have you failed recently? What are you responsible for? What are you afraid of, right? And then from there, you open up a different channel. And then in that gathering, you'll have readings of texts that are drawn from American civic life. You'll have someone give a, a civic sermon to try to connect the ethical choices that we make individually to the bigger problems here. But in the end, there are these circles where people form up and they say, I'm seeing my neighbor for the first time. I'm seeing this person who, I, who doesn't look like me, vote like me, pray like me. Um, and I'm actually going to sit down and talk with them about what are we going to do together to repair this community? Those are you know, what Tocqueville called habits of the heart uh, that are foundational to a democracy being able to sustain uh, and revive itself. Uh, and again, as much as leadership does matter, uh, this is about responsibility taking from the bottom up and the middle out. And I think we've got to have more of that in the United States right now. Um, leaders can do great harm, uh, but in the end, leaders are not going to be the ones who save us. We are going to be the ones who save us. I'd love to get to an audience question here. Christopher Comer is asking, what can socially conscious private sector companies do to reinforce, reimagine, and strengthen democracy in their communities? Uh, Eric, do you want to take a stab at that? Sure. I mean, I think um, you've seen uh, actually in response to a lot of these uh, uh, bills that are emerging around the country, Georgia and elsewhere, to restrict access uh, to the ballot, um, you've seen organizations like Civic Alliance, which is a, uh, an organization, a web of uh, several hundred uh, corporations around the United States, um, using some of their standing uh, to say, this is not okay, uh, using some of their voice and their clout to say, uh, to push back on some of these legislators, but also to set a, a standard that uh, uh, corporate uh, organizations are not going to stand by. That's one good thing. At the same time, let us be honest. Uh, uh, we live in a time right now where a lot of the anger uh, that is feeding conspiracy thinking, that is feeding polarization, um, is the result of incredible concentrations of wealth, a rigged game, inequality, uh, and ways in which some of those very corporations that are parts of the Civic Alliance, who I salute for uh, promoting voting, um, are grinding down workers and, uh, and sucking up wages uh, in a way that is making things worse. So one of the things that a res civically responsible corporation can do is to see workers not as costs to be minimized, but as customers to be cultivated and citizens to be respected. Uh, and the more companies that do that, the healthier kind of capitalism we're gonna have. I'm all for true capitalism, we just haven't seen it yet right now. When you see this kind of hoarding and, uh, and concentration of wealth in the hands of fewer and fewer, 
that's not capitalism, that's game rigging. And I think the, the, the analog to the true competition of ideas that Congressman Hurd is talking about is true competition in the marketplace. Uh, and we've got to have more of that uh, in a way that companies have to step up and, and lead by example on. Congressman, there's another question or a set of questions here for you. How do we address and resolve the partisan shipping away at constitutional checks and balances? And what's the impact of gerrymandering? Yeah, so I'll take that second part of the question. The impact of gerrymandering, you have to have a principle in which you design seats, right? And so I would like, if I had a magic wand, my principle would be make the seats competitive. If we had more seats like mine, right, that are, you know, 50-50 or close to 50-50, then you're going to start seeing, because, you know, and, and, you know, I want to say earlier, you know, Eric was talking about some of the ways to improve voting and, and, and like, those are some of the debates we should have. Let, let's, let's have some of the debates on some of the technical things, right, because, because, you know, I, I'm uncomfortable with ranked choice and some of those things, but um, imagine if we, because, because I believe you, the, 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 um, the motivation of the individual, the, the, you know, by, by having a, a, a seat that's 50-50, I have to work with Democrats. I have to get independents. I have to try to get some people that don't vote, right? So that's my motivation. And that's the motivation of someone that sits in one of those seats. And that you're gonna see some of that behavior. So how do we do that? One way, I, I think if you can um, design seats that are 50-50. Um, so, so, so yes, the, the, the polarization of the, of, the, of, 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 of the house is a direct correlation of the fact that there is less competitive seats. And, and all states are doing it, whether they're Republican um, or, or Democrat. And what was the first part of the question? It was about chipping away at constitutional checks and balances, and we're almost out of time, so. Yeah, so look, the, sometimes it doesn't feel like the system is working, but the, the system has worked. And some of these really crazy, outrageous things that all of us were afraid of didn't happen even when you know one party was was in power and so this this part about civic education understanding the importance of the checks and balances and how voting is is involved in that voting is the floor of civic engagement it's, it's not the pinnacle it's the thing everybody should be doing and then making sure you understand oh and by the way my last point i know we got to go but take off your jersey right like look i'm a san antonian i love the san antonio spurs I was hooting and hollering when, when I don't even want to say the individual's name who was here and went on to another team, right? But, but we got to stop looking at politics as sports, right? And, 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 and be thoughtful and be willing. When, when, did we, when did it happen when we describe ourselves first by our political affiliation rather than from the community we're from or the town we're from? And, and I think we do some of those changes, we'll be a lot better off. Moderator privilege, I want a quick lightning round with both of you here. Answer the question, what's at stake for democracy if we don't learn how to talk with one another again? Eric Liu, you want to go first quickly? Democracy works only if enough of us believe democracy works. And you can't just force that belief on people. That has to emerge from a sense of trust, place, belonging, respect, and recognition. And I guess, you know, to quote Tony Soprano, if you want to get respect, you got to show respect. And that means being able to rehumanize the people around you uh, and set off a different kind of cycle of, uh, of re-engagement with each other. And that's what's at stake is whether we can in fact live together in a union. Congressman, last Our word. future, our future, our future is at stake. Um, if we, if we want to leave a world better off for our children, our children's children, um, this is an existential question that we have to get right. Eric Liu and Congressman Will Hurd, thank you both for joining us here today. And we hope that all of you out there have enjoyed our first episode of the Reimagining Democracy series. Our next episode is gonna come up on June 24th. It's gonna be called The Vote. You can register at reimaginingdemocracy.org. In the meantime, continue the conversation on social media. It is hashtag reimaginingdemocracy. I'm Jean Meserve. We'll see you next time.